Can you guys see the, the screen okay? Yep, you can see it in your virtual machine. Beautiful. Well, uh, this is actually my Hyper-V host, but uh, of course you have PowerPoint on that one, as you do uh, these days. All right then, uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Greg and Josh and all the others uh, across these three user groups to, for, for having me and Anders joining. Uh, Today, talking about one of our absolute favorite to topics, uh, making sure that the config man environment is as happy and healthy as it possibly can be. Uh, it has been a long journey, and even the product these days has a lot of built-in tools that, that can help you uh, keep the environment up the track. It was more challenging back in the, the early days, even back in the SMS days, to, to uh, keep stuff happy and healthy. PowerShell and a bit of other things. Yeah, life is good. Um, me and Andres, we, we both absolutely love questions. So if you have any, please use the chat and we'll be happy to, to answer them during the session. Uh, we would love this to be an interactive discussion. And again, don't hesitate to, to fire away those questions. Other than that, uh, my name is Johan. I'll be your host for the next 50 minutes together with, with Anders. And uh, my primary home these days is uh, Two Point Software, but I also have a, uh, another company I work with, Mirrorless, and that's where we do all the trainings and all the other fun stuff related to extra consulting gig and yeah, you name it. Uh, Anders, would you like to say a few words about yourself before we head on? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Anders Rodland. Um, I'm very happy to be here again. Uh, and as you once said, it's like if you have any questions uh, during this presentation, please uh, just fire them as we go. We love to answer these questions. Um, uh, I will, uh, me and Johan will share this presentation. Johan will uh, start and I will go in and show a demo of something I showed on the last session, but I will have a little bit different angle this time. Excellent. All right, let's do it. So we have four main pillars prepared for this session. Um, focusing a little bit on how design and infrastructure, um, simplifying that can help a lot of, of configuration issues and other things in the environment. Uh, we added in a section on focusing on operations, basically what your operations team if they're not already doing it, what they should be doing on a sort of a daily, weekly, monthly basis, etc. We have a section covering the sort of service side of health and performance, so management point and distribution points and all the other uh, side roles that you have in the environment. And finally, uh, what to do on the client side for the client health. And to get started, um, it may surprise me, uh, um, I'm from Sweden originally, uh, but I actually played American football for a good five and a half years in, in college. One of the very few teams in, in Sweden at that time. Uh, I remember we being like 12 teams in the country. Uh, and it's a fairly long country, so there was a lot of buses or traveling by bus. But our coach, our head coach, he has, uh, uh, he kept saying kiss for everything. Keep things simple, stupid. That was his sort of go to thing. And I think that pretty much applies very, very well to config man design as well. Uh, back in the days when, when config man 2012 came and, and a lot of <sighs> folks out there made the most interesting designs that I've ever seen. Like, yeah, we have a thousand clients. Let's have a CAS with four primaries for those thousand clients. Like, how about having a single primary in one DP? Uh, there's a lot of things you can do. One organization I worked with, they had 150 some secondary sites. And that was a fun project to, to having to deal with. But these days, even larger organizations, uh, one customer I've been working with out in, they have their headquarters out in, in Europe, but they're a global customer. Um, 5,000 some sites, 55,000 clients, single primary site bunch of distribution points, but not too many. They have like 16 or 17 now distribution points around the globe. That to me is a simple design and it's quite easy to keep healthy. As long as you start to complicate things like doing these really advanced setups, that's also when you start to see it's going to be hard to maintain 
and, and troubleshoot. And I have seen smaller customers like just a few thousand clients going to, yeah, we're going to have a SQL cluster. We're going to put in high availability. And it's like, no, you should not. If it breaks, restore it from the backup. You're so small, so you can do that entire operation in like two hours at most. Shorter if you practiced. So to me, Config Manager for most organizations is not as critical as, say, email is. You can often reboot a config manager site server in the middle of the day. Nobody would even notice. Uh, and if you plan for it, maintenance is usually not a problem. I remember back in the days when if I wanted to upgrade a, a system, we have to schedule that for off hours or weekends and whatnot. These days when we do servicing on config manager, we are often allowed to do it daytime even. Even if they, they know the service is going to be down for an hour or hour and a half, maybe depending on your size. But that is that is okay. And then of course uh, we all love to do documentation, but that is also part of, of being able to track things down when things change because you can simply uh, compare stuff. And in order to learn and play around with and getting to know your environment and getting to know Config Manager and what you can do in in terms of of health, is having the best tool available. And in my opinion, the best tool any sysadmin or any config manager admin can have is to have a lab environment where you can play around and test and learn things without necessarily breaking production. Uh, there is a classic saying that every config manager admin actually has a lab. And the follow up to that one is some are also lucky to have a production environment. It doesn't have to be that way. You can actually have a real production environment. And you can have a simple Hyper-V host where you do a lot of testing and things. Their organization have really large lab environments in QA and dev and test and, and acceptance of whatever they call them. But it doesn't have to be a massive one. It can be a simple one too uh, to do this. So in terms of the infrastructure, um, if you want to get something that helps you get going, uh, on my blog for years, I have published various hydration kits, and this is just PowerShell script that builds up a complete lab environment uh, in just a few hours. Uh, we would have loved to be able to offer ready-made kits for downloads like, like Microsoft can, but if I would, I would have lawyers on the phone like right away. So we built PowerShell scripts that basically take a folder structure with content that you downloaded, that you accepted the license agreement for, and then it just sets up everything for you fully automated. So all in all, the technician time is maybe half an hour, the build time is maybe three hours in total, but these kits basically allows you to build a bunch of VMs that has a full site server implementation and you can add as many additional servers and clients as you want to that mix, but you have to start somewhere. If you haven't got a lab, I highly recommend to, to check this out and, and play around with it. It's not the only kit available, but it's a kit and having a lab environment these days to me is, is absolutely, absolutely key. Hardware wise, don't have to go overboard. Uh, you'll be just fine with uh, any PC, usually a desktop these days, but it can be a laptop. I see a lot of folks using laptops for lab environments these days. But as long as you can get something that has uh, 32 gig of RAM, have an i7 CPU or equivalent Xeon or, or shinier, of course, uh, and a one terabyte NVMe uh, SSD, uh, you're usually good. And if you're low on budget, you can find such a machine on eBay for about three, four hundred dollars these days. Uh, not that big of a deal. If you can get a new machine from work, fantastic. Uh, one of the companies I actually worked for back in the day is um, Knowledge Factory. They were based up in over in Europe. They actually had in their employee agreement that every consultant that was brought on board would get their own lab machine. And now we weren't talking desktop or laptop anymore. Each consultant got their own real lab server, like a massive HP server with lots of disks and CPU and memory. And that was just a genius move 
from that manager. That was a manager that actually got it. It's like, yeah, if you give them this, they will not only learn stuff, but they also play around on their spare time uh, just for fun, because uh, that's what you end up doing usually. So anyhow, having a lab environment to me is absolutely key. Keeping things simple uh, makes anything health related much, much simpler. And documenting is something we often leave behind. But these days it doesn't have to be too difficult. There is a gentleman, Paul Vetter. He has written a downright amazing documentation script. It was based on the earlier projects from David O'Brien. Um, but this, this script is just uh, amazing. I think I said a copy of it here somewhere. Here we go. So uh, if you do a bit of a creative search, all the better. Whoops. Again. There we go. Documentation script right here. Download, run it in my environment. I have a few hundred clients, maybe 25 servers or so. Uh, it takes about five minutes to run. But what I get after running it is a report, a nice formatted HTML file. And if I open up that in, in Edge, this is just an end to end documentation of your entire site server. History from updates. You can see this one has been around for a while. Uh, everything you can think of in a config man environment. Every role, every server, every configuration, every script, every sequence, every application, every package, every everything is in this documentation. And it's not that hard to run it. And then at least you have it. Because all this information is quite useful to have if you end up having to do a restore uh, at some point. So quite, quite useful. Uh, script and how he finds time to write it, I, I don't know because that's a that's a heck of an effort to to put together documentation scripts. It's just a lot of lot of code. All right. Then of course we have the operations. And me and my good friend Jordan Bensing, we actually set out a while ago, uh, after being asked from one of our customers to provide to their operations team some task that that they could do. So on my blog, we we put together a little practical guide to to operations, and that's basically things that the ops team would have to do every now and then. This list is is far from a complete list. But this is a great starting point if you don't have one already. And uh, what this customer ended up doing was actually for most of these tasks that were on these lists, they actually schedule tickets, especially for the weekly ones. So their service now portal would every week create a ticket for one of the tasks, assign it to whoever's supposed to fix it or or do it, and then uh, they would have to close that ticket and say, yeah, we we we. We finished it off. But there are just simple things like making sure you don't have a massive backlog in, in your inboxes because that indicates server issues. Make sure that you're ah, this I've seen this so many times. Just making sure there is free disk space available on all site systems. It's not too hard to check. Simple PowerShell script and you're good. Verify that backups are going. Verify that the config man database is not growing out of proportion because that could be an indication that something is, is fishy. Checking event logs. Um, just doing regular things. This one, I, I, I lost count a number of times I've seen distribution points, basically filling up the entire C drive because nobody bothered to check the, the log files. And it's, it's so easy to put in routines to do that. Um, another script that you can download from, from my blog is um, to search for housekeeping. Um, 
I have a post about that, but this one I think is the more interesting one. Here you find a little PowerShell script that you can simply schedule on your servers that have IS that every day will would run and clean out the log file for older IS log files. Um, if a distribution points are having problems, you can actually, these can grow quite rapidly. I've seen environments with several gigs per day in these log files and simply have to do the math. All right, I have 60 gigs free in my C drive. They're growing by five gig per day. 60 divided by five, 12. All right, it's gonna run for almost two weeks and then it's gonna die at that server. Or you get creative and you download a CI that you deploy, or create a baseline and deploy it through Config Manager and have it run every day or every second day on all your IS servers, uh, especially distribution points, um, because they're usually the one that, that creates these massive uh, log files. But simple things that you can do uh, from an operations point of view. Weekly stuff is usually making sure that you catch up, that you actually did all the daily ones, and then you start figuring out trends and, and just start to see patterns in the environment. And, and Config Manager these days actually has um, quite a decent number of built-in things that help you monitor the, the service side of things. So we have what I refer to as old school tools, meaning if you go to your site server and you peek in an installation folder, I happen to have mine on the E drive here. Check the tools folder uh, and the server tools. You have the classic collection evaluation viewer now built into the console, but this one still works. You can still use it and if you feel like it, you can see your various uh, collection times, evaluations, and if these values are not in, in, in uh, seconds, but rather many minutes or even hours, something is not good. That means sometimes someone has been extremely creative creating nested select queries and uh, whatever they have on their collections. Do you have the good old DB job manager where you can track um, all traffic between the, the site server and all the distribution points, allowing you to reprioritize jobs and uh, manage them and you know cancel them if needed, etc. I don't have any going right now, but this one is usually pretty busy in a production environment. But then of course we have all the stuff that is now built into the console itself. So if you go to the monitoring workspace, I know that Kent last, I would say last week, but last meeting, uh, he went through some of the scenario health uh, items has been added and they can be run and reviewed and you can get a history and, and current one or the earlier ones and it's just a lot of useful information uh, in the environment. And then of course you have each and every status. You have distribution status for all your uh, distribution points, etc. You have your client status, you have your system status, and these have been around for a long time, but they're still valuable when, when trying to verify that the server health is, is good enough. So if I would go to component status, um, I actually had an issue earlier this week. Let's see if I can still check it up. It's okay now, but... Uh, oh, that one is gone, all right. Uh, I had a, a few packages where I accidentally um, deleted the um, source folder. Uh, so that would give me a lot of grief and, and uh, whining about it. Then of course you have the dashboards even for the client, etc. But what you can also do is something that um, I started to do more and more also on the server side. And that is having something else than Config Manager checking Config Manager. And in this case, a bit of PowerShell. So on my blog, I have a, uh, let's see, else. 
I have a little post call holistic approach to config my client health, but this one also apply for servers. The very concept here is having something that gathers information that makes sense for you to gather. So as an example, one of the customers I've been working with, they were constantly running into issues of their distribution points. So we started to figure out, okay, what data can we collect on each distribution point that will help us fix stuff before they actually became a problem? And most of these solutions, they work very similar. So here I have a PowerShell script that simply, first of all, connects to the site server and get me all distribution points. Uh, very quick and dirty WMI method, but it works. I could have used it uh, to config bandit command as well, but I had the snippets, I used it. I'm copying out a script to every distribution point. I run it and I collect the information and summarize that back in a port on the server. In this case, I'm not depending on the config manager client because for that one to be able to be healthy, it needs to work. I mean, it has to be healthy to, to, to actually run a script for me. So I prefer to use a different methods for running these scripts. I was starting to poke around what type of information that, that we are getting. This is an earlier example, same script, but it's basically we are collecting data points that helped us making sure that these distribution points, they were up to the task of what they're supposed to do. They were not running out of disk space. Uh, this is just some extra code. They had the branch cache configuration done, the publication cache the way it's supposed to be, services running, uh, the network they were supposed to have. Um, and this is not so big of a deal when you use servers as DPs, but good luck in finding a, a server on wireless. But when using clients as distribution point, it may very well be the case. But just different values that we made sense to us to, to gather, summarize, and bring into Excel. Because the thing is, even if you have thousands of servers or tens of thousands of clients, you can actually drill down into that data through Excel pretty quickly, pretty accurate, and immediately start to see trends, things that are, okay, so here we are about to run out of disk space. The following machines does not have the right services running. These clients are not talking to this right distribution point, stuff like that, because it all comes down to just, and, and this is for both server and client, but, but basically with a bit of PowerShell or whatever script method you prefer, I happen to like PowerShell, you can collect data that, that helps you uh, see what's about to happen in the, in the environment. Uh, before jumping into the, to the client side, um, are there any questions worthy of um, bringing up and, and chat about? Have you seen anything in the chat, Anders, that, that made sense to you? Or appeal to you, should I say? Uh, it's good if I'm not muted. Yes, yeah, so far uh, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I mean, Greg and Josh, uh, if you stumble across something that, that you see, feel free to, to interrupt and, and just say, hey, we had a, this amazing question here. Uh, what are your thoughts on this one? So that will work. Will do. Will do. Thanks. Excellent. All right. So uh, on, on the client side of things, it's very similar because like we can collect data points on a distribution point, we can do that on clients, but it's usually different values we want to collect. So in this example here, um, also checking things like what type of connection do they have, punching or, or collecting a lot of conflict manager related info, like the client version, how they're doing on cache, how they're doing on the boundary group. Are they assigned to the right boundary group, but they don't have a boundary group at all? Or are they assigned to multiple boundary groups? What was the last distribution point they were using? This one has helped me a lot over the years because one of the customers, they had clients in Argentina 
connecting to distribution points in Germany. And that was not the closest DP for those clients, put it that way. But without gathering that information and present it nicely in an Excel spreadsheet, it's really hard to, to figure out because it works, but it's just extremely inefficient from a networking point of view. And all these scripts are, are up on GitHub if you want to play around with them. Uh, feel free to steal, borrow, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, this is for our own little agent, so I'm just going to skip that for now. But just getting stuff, I mean, this one here. If there is one thing that will break a config manager client upgrade, it's going to be this one. It's, I think it's been fixed now, but for the longest time, when you started to hit 75,000 client uh, files in the temp folder, the config manager client upgrade would not be happy. It would basically fail to compile the MOF files. By record so far, we had one customer with a, a client in, 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 in Asia, 1.3 million files in the temp folder. Uh, that's the personal best so far, and I had to say I was a little bit concerned even connecting to that machine through a like a whack whack UNC type connection. I didn't dare to log into it because I kind of expected that something going on on that particular computer that that uh, was not happy. For this customer, we also gathered the .NET Framework version, uh, etc. And just again, gathering all this information, summarizing them, uploading them actually as CSV files uh, to the server. Uh, just for folder, just dump them in, summarize them into Excel spreadsheet, and that was our little health check. But it turned out that you can do much better than just a little PowerShell snippet. And that's where uh, Mr. Anders come into the picture because he's done that. He's gone above and far beyond my little tiny attempts with PowerShell scripts and implemented and created a complete uh, health check platform. And the price for that one is just right as well. It's free. It always has been. So Anders, would you be so kind? Absolutely, and uh, it always will be free too. I, it was released to the community. That was the best decision I ever did for that solution because uh, the community embraced it and they started uh, providing additional uh, fixes for the, like when a config manager client would break. So that was a very good decision for the customers that I was working with because they also ended up with a better uh, solution that would fix it. So let me take over the screen share here really quick thank you so much uh you want uh, hey one one question for you guys while you transition here you there was a question in the chat about um lab environment and networking are there any type of caveats to be aware of with how you configure that networking or having the primary on the same uh network as managed clients well, from a, uh, there's an excellent question. So, so first of all, lab environments, you usually have a complete setup. So you have the NS, the ACP and everything, stuff like that. And, and if we just take those VMs and put them out on the production network, you would usually upset your, your networking folks. So that is not recommended. So what I recommend having is basically, uh, I may have a few extra, but a bunch of different internal networks and then when needed, route them out to production to get like internet access, et cetera. But a favorite of mine is, is using virtual routers. Uh, PF7s happen to be the router of my cho choice. I, I, I just like it. But this one, for example, is one of my main routers. And this one has one network that provides internet access through Hyper-V NAT feature, and then a bunch of other networks that are uh, routed through this little thing, allowing me to simulate a fairly large distributed environment on just a single Hyper-V host. So what I have here is I have uh, a bunch of clients. They, they are in different sites in Chicago. They are throttled because PFSense can throttle traffic. I have a bunch of machines in um, uh, 
New York, they're not farther at all. They have a bunch of machines in Seattle. They are behind a 45 megabit link. And, and in these platforms, you can actually um, see if I can connect one of them here. Uh, you can create limiters. So, so uh, traffic chips. So I can introduce latency. I can introduce package loss. I can do all these things that a normal production network would, but I have that on a single Hyper-V host. So this is a bit of a more extreme lab host, and I, and I have a few of these, but these are HP workstations, lots of memory, lots of CPU. Uh, this one was a Christmas gift, uh, but uh, the one other bought we got was about $1,200 on eBay. And that was like, sure, it's a lot of money, but dang, what a host to get for that kind of money. Mm -hmm. um, but but keep them isolated. Um, route only out traffic when needed. Uh, keep the rest inside your lab network because you, you want to be able to play with production type network, but you don't want to be on the production network. That, that would be my, my take on it. Great, thanks. And I see somebody uh, added to the chat as well, linked to uh, your networking. So um, that's there always been a struggle with me when I set up labs. So yeah, thanks. Welcome. All right, Anders. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, so I'm not going to repeat everything I, I said because I did present Config Manager Client Health on the previous user group session I had here. So I'm just going to do a quick recap for those who missed that. Uh, Config Manager Client Health is a, a PowerShell script, PowerShell solution that I wrote, what is it now, five, six years ago? I think. I, I, um, it was it came as the result of a large patch incident we had with a customer where uh, we were managing uh, the clients for a customer and uh, I was responsible for the config manager side and uh, when we brought that customer in we realized uh, uh, we were only able to manage about uh, six, 60 percent of, of their devices it's like 60 percent of the devices we were able to successfully install patches on and update the remaining we we, we they just failed. We spent a lot of time investigating why it turned out to be the config manager client was the reason for a lot of those issues. Uh, it was a bit of an extreme case. And, and you can't really tell a customer to, uh, here's a list of 5,000 machines that you need to reinstall, you know, because I because the config manager client doesn't work. That, uh, that doesn't really fly. So, um, I wrote that solution, I uh, call it config manager client health. It would just go in and look for all those specific items that we found, and then it would implement the fixes for them. Then I decided to take it further. Um, I uh, uh, started to, I, I did a, re a lot of research in the community where other people in, in the community around Config Manager had found issues with the client and how they fixed it. And I started, I started to implement proper detection methods for these errors. I tested it and I tested, tested a fix. So what I ended up with was a pretty extensive PowerShell script that uh, it runs on the client. It's initial the client, so it doesn't depend upon Config Manager to start anything. Because if Config Manager loses management of a device, it's not going to be able to fix that device. So uh, yeah, the, the PowerShell script it. Uh, um, yeah, it, it, it's initiated by the client or by the endpoint itself. Uh, it runs a long list of, of uh, tests just to detect if something is broken. Uh, some of them are easy to fix, other requires the, that we reinstall uh, the client itself. Um, and then it reads a config file from a centralized location. Um, and uh, by deploying like a scheduled task that can uh, that will start this uh, PowerShell script, you, you, you'll end up with um, uh, yeah, you, you end up with, with something on all your endpoints that where it runs a proper health check. It, if the client is broken, it will fix it. And for this customer that I mentioned, right, we, we were only patching about 60%. When we implemented this, it's like it skyrocketed. It, it went up to something somewhere like 97, 98%. Like. Um, like on the next patch cycle, it was everybody were amazed, and I, I went from being the one everybody were upset with to I, I became the hero in, in that meeting. So that was a lot of fun. 
So very quickly, what is this? Uh, uh, how does this process work, right? The Coffee Manager Client Health, it executes, it's a PowerShell script, it executes locally on, on the endpoint, it detects and remediates any errors that it, it, it finds, and then uh, there is a database, uh, and, and the database can run on either, uh, it, it needs SQL Server, but it, it works to run it on SQL Express, so it doesn't require a, a fully licensed SQL Server. And you can put a web service uh, in the middle between the, the, uh, the script between the client and the SQL Server, so you don't expose your your, your SQL Server to the to the clients. And then the uh, the result of the health check is sent uh, to the web service using uh, HTTP or HTTPS. And then the web service have a service account that it will uh, connect to the database and update the database with. And I'm hoping everybody's still here. My mouse froze a little bit there. And the requirements for config, configuration manager, what are those? Uh, for the endpoints, we require PowerShell 5.1 or a newer version of that. And uh, Config Manager Client Health, it, ideally you want it to execute with system privileges and you can you achieve that by having a scheduled task uh, start the, the Config Manager Client Health. And, and the scheduled task, you can create that using uh, group policy. And then a web service, uh, what do that require? It, it requires .NET Framework 4.8. Uh, uh, version. The original version I had of this was built on .NET Core 2, which was a uh, which became depreciated, and there was security hole or security vulnerabilities. So I, I rewrote it using a, a version of .NET Framework that it looks like Microsoft will support for a, a good amount of time. So that that should be much safer. And when I looked through the documentation, I actually realized that I never documented this, but uh, the web service do require the uh, Windows Server feature uh, uh, ASP.NET 4.7. Uh, it do require that in order to execute this. It requires internet information services, and it also requires a service, ac service account with permissions on the database. And then you need the SQL Server in the back end. And that was about all the PowerPoint that I have because uh, I'm not really a PowerPoint man. I do prefer to use a virtual machine. I do pre prefer uh, looking into the actual te technology itself. So I gave an overview of Config Manager Client Health in the last user group, this uh, this time I'll focus more on the configuration and we'll look a little bit more into the web service itself because I do realize that that is where most people have issues uh, when it comes to implementing this. It's like getting the script up and running is fine, getting the uh, creating the, the group policy that, that creates the scheduled task that see, people seem to, to get that fine, but I get a lot of questions about the web service. So we're gonna we're gonna look deeper into that, um, but really quick how it works. Um, uh, the config manager client health you extract it into a location, uh, just a simple folder. You, but how I have chosen to do it is I have created a, a folder on uh, this uh, ecolon client health. This is on my config manager server. This one is shared out, uh, so I, I'm sharing it as uh, client health dollar. Uh, you do want to put permissions on here. You don't want, let me see if I have done this correctly. I haven't, this is bad of me. You don't want people to change this. You want you want to lock it down. You also want to, want to lock it down on uh, the security. You, don't, you want to make sure that you don't want many people to be able to make changes uh, to this folder, right? Because if you think about it, you have a social script executing a system on all your endpoints. You don't want uh, people to just come in and make changes to the script. And you also want to sign the script. So that said, there is this config file. I have this config XML. This is where you configure uh, client health, how it will behave. Right? We have here like a, a, a version. This is like the minimum version of the config manager client. If, if the client health determines that I need to reinstall uh, the config manager client on this endpoint, uh, or if it detects that you are below this version, right? In, the, in this, I have 85.53.006. So if it, if it would detect that the, the version of the Config Manager client installed on this machine is an older version than what I specified here, it will automatically tag the client uh, and, cli and client help will, will reinstall it uh, and upgrade the, the client for you. 
Then we also have some um, uh, information here, right? I can configure the cache size. Uh, how large do I want the, ca uh, the cache size of the config manager client to be? I will want to check on it to see if that if it's properly configured to this size or not. Uh, here we will define the installation parameters. If Config Manager Client Health determines I need to I need to install uh, the Config Manager Client, it will use the uh, the install properties that we define here. So you can add more or you can remove this uh, according to your preference. But you want to find something that you're confident with that the, it, with these installation properties, it will always succeed installing or upgrading the client. Then there are more options in here, like we can configure different uh, health checks if I want to enable them or, or, or not. And some of them, it can run in Remedy. It, it can run, I have the, the tag fix equals true. That means that uh, it will actually, if it breaks, it will actually fix it. If, if I change that to false, it's not going to fix it, but it's going to report back to the database that it's broken. So that's it. That's the config file. Uh, then we have the config manager client health, the PowerShell script there. And we have um, a database. I have a few more tables in my database than what you have in the version I released. That's because I'm working on a pretty big, um, big upgrade for this. But uh, you'll see, like I have the, the in the in the client health uh, database on the SQL Server, I have a table called uh, clients, and in here, uh, every endpoint that runs client health and updates or sends the results to the database, it will show up here as a line. So. This is where you can see the result of the health check. And because this is in SQL, you can run SQL reporting services, or you can run Power BI, and you can create reports or dashboards on this as well. So, and one of the first things that happened when I created this and I moved this publicly is like I had only tested this on Windows 7, Windows 8, and Windows 10 when I released it. And then there was a guy in India, he replied back to me saying, like, Thank you, I have 16,000 servers. So my heart jumped, right? I never tested it on a server. So I immediately started, decided like, I'm gonna make sure this works properly on a server. So ever since like version 0 or 2 or something, I, I, I tested it on servers. So I'm just gonna run the health check right now on my a configuration manager just to, to prove that point. And I run it by the, by the parameters, right? It's like uh, the config manager client health, like the script file. I run the dash config, I point to the config XML. I run the dash web service and I point it to the web service. In this case, my web service is https memcm androsrodland.com slash config manager client help. Then I just execute it. And it's running. I don't think it's going to fix anything because I ran this earlier today. But you can see it ran through fairly quick. And in the end, here it's saying update a SQL database with results using web service. And if I now go back here and we'll see before I execute this query, query again, we'll see my previous timestamp here. It was today, but it was a little bit earlier in the day than it. So I'll execute this again. And now this one have, uh, let's see, it's still the rope, MAMCM, yeah. Now this one has updated with um, an, a newer time. No, sorry, that was the last boost time. Uh, let's see the timestamp. Yeah, here we go. This one has now updated with, with a newer time of when I executed that. So one of the things I wanted to uh, focus on in today's session was uh, the web service, because I realized like a lot of people have issues with that. That's where I get the most amount of questions. Like you're getting out of 500 internal web server, error, something is wrong, and it's can be a little bit difficult to troubleshoot. So I'm just going to walk through the process of how would you configure the web service? How do you make it work, right? The, the, the first place you want to step uh, or, or you want to start would be your SQL server, right? You need to make sure that you have the database installed, client health. Uh, you create that database by just running this create Anders, database. Yeah. Uh, sorry for interrupting, but uh, there was actually a few questions on that particular topic. So first of all, uh, people want to know like quick overview, wh where are the best guides to get through the installation step-by-step, step, but also for migrating from an, an older implementation to using the new one uh, with the web service, if you have a chance to touch up on that a little bit. Absolutely. So uh, let me just go here. Um, I open up here, like Coffee Manager Client Health, I publish it on GitHub. Uh, people are contributing. I'm happy to accept 
uh, accept contributions. I'm going to test them thoroughly before I accept anything. Uh, but to answer your question, uh, I have a blog post uh, on my blog here, andreswadler.com. It's going to load. It looks like it's like, taking a little bit of time. I don't have as good web host as you want to have. Um, but it's coming here. This link here, andreswadler.com slash confidential client health. Uh, it, cont it contains the latest documentation. Um, and in here, it also, uh, I see I need to update some things here when it comes to it. But we have here like the PowerShell, uh, it's like the command line, how, how you would um, execute this. Um, uh, I have a link here to, uh, it's like, I, I'm saying, how, how do you install it, right? You, you, uh, you should place it on a network share available to all clients where everyone has read access and only administrators have write access. This would be the PowerShell command you execute it with if you haven't signed the script. I recommend you to sign the script so you don't have to run it in uh, execution policy bypass. And it also prevents people from making changes. Uh, I then recommend to create a group policy that creates a scheduled task that runs the, the, this PowerShell script uh, on your endpoints. Uh, and I have another uh, blog post here how, that details how you, create, uh, how you create a scheduled task. And this will go through, I even use Config Manager Client Health as the example in this blog post. So Andres, do, you have a, do you have another link for the, the reports? Did they migrate over to GitHub as well? So those reports, that's a very good question. I am not the author of those reports. That was somebody else who created them. So it's like I have them locally on my system. I, I don't have them. Uh, I wouldn't have to reach out to that guy who originally created them because uh, I probably shouldn't republish them in my name when I'm not the author of them. So uh, there is actually a trick to that. I'm using that a lot for the Technic Gallery. And that's go to the Wayback Machine because it's actually contained the entire Technic Gallery in its repositories. So if there is a old script that was up there and you're missing, we can still access it through the Wayback Machine. And uh, yeah, I'll post that link in the chat. Uh, uh, thank, thank, thank you for that, John. That's actually a great point. Because um, yeah, it, it is it should be available on the uh, on the way back machine that that, that report because that was a good uh, good report in my in my opinion. I'm I'm not saying uh, I mean <laughs> they have snapshots since since the beginning of time. The Techno Gallery you can actually find some pretty good stuff there when you poke around. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, thank you for that, Johan. Um, if it's okay, I, I'll continue a little bit there. Uh, yeah, so I, I ran the PowerShell script here on the Config Manager uh, server. It ran successfully. So I'm I just want to look at like how the web service is configured, right? Where do we start? Um, or, or like the prerequisites, since I know a lot of people have issues with it. You want to make sure you have the database installed. Um, you do that by executing uh, create database uh, dot SQL. It's provided in the package uh, for Config Manager Client Health. It's just a SQL query. Uh, this SQL query, it's, uh, I created it in such a way that it will create the database if it does not exist. If I make, if I release a new version and I make any changes to the database, you just run this query over the, uh, on the same server. It will detect any changes that I made since the version that you're currently on, and it will just upgrade it. So that's just a simple uh, SQL query. So you, you need that, then you need a service account. Uh, and in my case, I call that client health. That service account, uh, you need to give it the, on the client health database, you need to give it data, data reader and data writer. Those are the permissions that you need to set. That's all the permissions that need to have. You need to have a public login uh, on the SQL server, and then it needs to have the permission on the database like so that it can read and write. And that's what you need from the SQL side. Then the next thing you need to do is uh, uh, you need to extract the, the web service. I'm using the latest one, version 2.01. Uh, this one is based upon .NET Framework 4.8. So you, yeah, you need to install .NET Framework 4.8. Uh, you have the web config. This is where you make uh, changes. It's not that, uh, I'm sorry, this is actually not uh, mine. That was. Uh, 
that was not my web service. Mine is in that was actually Nikolai's that I entered. This is this is the one I have config manager client help. So you go to the web.com. Uh, in the bottom here, there is a connection string. Yeah, you point that to the uh, your server like memcm as well and not common case, the database. And I have the trusted connection on that's because uh, I'm using integrated Windows authentication. I, and, and all that means is that uh, the, the application pool that we will run the web service under in IIS, that application pool will provide the credentials that the web service will use to log in to the, to the SQL server. So we have the web service, we just extract the files here, we edit webconfig.com, just update the connection string so it points to your uh, SQL server. You need to make sure if the, if the SQL database is located on a different server than the one you're on, you need to make sure that port 1433 is open so that SQL traffic uh, can pass through. So then we go to the uh, Internet Information Services. Uh, I have an application pool here. Uh, Create it, call it Config Manager Client Health. How this is configured is .NET CLR version. This is set to 4.0. The old version used no managed code. So this is actually a change from version one to version two when I changed the version of .NET framework. Uh, so we used version 4.0. I need to go down here, identity. I need to specify the credentials that I use. I have a custom account here. This is the my main name slash client health that account that I show I given permission to on the SQL side. Uh, that's really all there is to it. Uh, it's like as I said, the big change from version one to version two here is that in the in the app pool change it from no managed code to version 4.0. And uh, Here's a good question for you, Anders. Uh, Johnny asks if uh, if the community donates, would you consider signing that script with a public cert? Absolutely, I can do that. Uh, and I have thought about that that many times. Actually, I've I've always learned lean back on on that when, when you're running a script on your endpoints as system, you want to know what's happening, right? It's like ideally you want to take the time and read through what the script is script does understand what it does and then sign it and then sign it once you know what it does but yeah I, I wouldn't be willing to do something like that okay had a couple of people ask too about um, you know remote employees and not being able to get to file shares things like that uh, I might have missed that I don't know if you tackled anything on that right any scenarios for how to use Azure blob storage or other ways to potentially get to files when uh, when you're not on network? So that's a great question. Thank you for that. And Brian Dam actually has a different version uh, or different uh, method of uh, sharing this uh, cl client health. Um, he has a group policy that would uh, copy the, the client health from a share to locally on the machine. That works works really well as well. It, it it just ensures that like if he if Brian would make changes on uh, on his share, the GPO would update the files locally. That would be one way. But that but for remote workers, that would require um, that would require a VPN connection, right? You you may not always have that VPN connection. So to get this to work remotely, it is fully possible to do that. Uh, you can put the uh, these files here, you can put them, uh, or like the the files for for the, for the client health, you can put them on an Azure blob, uh, and then the web service, you could publish that externally using Azure AD application proxy, and that way the script can update the web service. Uh, it's like because now now it's available publicly. Thanks. Jose, I see your hands up. You have anything to uh, to ask there, or uh, we'll, we'll take your hand down. Oh, hand went down. All good. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, thank you, Anders. Let me start to share my screen. We'll pop here and see if anybody has any final questions. Lots of good nuggets in the uh, in the chat. So appreciate that. Keep them coming. Really appreciate that. Okay, and uh, Johan, I was jumping around uh, at the beginning here. I think you did. You have a chance to talk a little bit about our giveaways today. I I did not, but I, I I'll be happy to. 
because this yeah. is something that I wanted to do for a very long time, but finally got a chance to do this year. Um, I mean, I've been doing trainings all my life for since back in and the 3.51 classes, uh, but these classes are typically four or five days long. And what we found was that not everybody on the this little planet either can afford or have the chance to stay away from work for five days or a combination of both. So we, we created these longer courses. So they run for six weeks. There are two hours each week and a bunch of different topics, uh, MDT, Config Manager, Intune, uh, config manager operations and stuff like that. So uh, we wanted to, to give uh, you guys a chance to, to uh, raffle uh, a few of these passes out. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, this is huge. We really appreciate this. Uh, we have three of these today. So uh, one after each session, uh, we're going to give away. So let me do this. Uh, we're going to do our first raffle.